So these two experiences happen within a month of each other. The first one happened to my brother-in-law. The second one I witnessed firsthand. So here we go. Back in 2007, my sister and her husband used to live with me and my mother. I was in middle school at the time. One Saturday night, my brother-in-law was working at his security job, and my sister and I were with my mom at a church function. These church services would last until about 8 to 8.30, so we wouldn't get home until around 9. That night, we pulled up to our mobile home. Usually, my brother-in-law would be inside waiting for us, but instead, he was outside standing by himself, looking like he had seen a ghost. As we pull into the carport, I notice that all the lights are off inside. When we get out of the car, he lifts his hand, points at the house, and says in a shaken voice, I'm not going in there by myself. We asked him what happened, and this is what he told us. I came home, and I was walking into the carport, and was about to enter the house. I heard what sounded like a group of people talking and laughing inside the house. I heard silverware and dishes clinking like there was some sort of dinner party, but all the lights were off. I thought you guys were trying to pull a prank on me or something. So I go up the steps and I pull out my house key. The whole time, I still hear muffled chatter and laughing and even music. As soon as I put the house key into the doorknob lock, I heard someone go, shh. And then the entire house went silent, like everything just stopped at once. As soon as I open the door, I hear a fucking stampede of people running in the opposite direction. At this point, I'm starting to think that it wasn't a prank, and some people had broken into the house and were trying to leave before they got caught. So I ran around the back of the house to cut them off at the back door. But once I got there, everything went quiet. I thought that maybe whoever was inside didn't run out because they knew I was on the other side. So I sprinted back to the front door, opened it, and ran inside. It was quiet and pitch black. I turn on all the lights and clear the entire house. Not one thing was out of place. Nothing to indicate at all that anyone was there. That's when I ran outside and waited for you guys to get here. The second occurrence happened a month later, in the same house. My mom was out doing something, I don't remember what, and my sister and her husband were on a date. Halo 3 had just come out, and my brother-in-law kept his Xbox in his room. Before he left that night, I begged him to play the game while he was gone, and he reluctantly agreed. So I had the whole house all to myself. I turned on all the lights in the house for obvious reasons, but since I wanted the full effect of the video game, I turned off the light in my brother-in-law's room. So the only light was coming from the TV. As I'm playing, I feel like someone's walking around in the house. When living in a mobile home, you can feel every movement. I paused the game and waited to hear something. After a few moments of silence, I decided to say something. Hello? No response. I go back to playing the game, brushing off the noise. A few moments later, I see a shadow from under the door out of the corner of my eye. I pause the game and look directly at the door, and the shadow moves out of sight. At first, I think someone had come home early, so I call out again, but I get no response. Now, I'm getting a little freaked out and sitting in the dark room trying to hear any noises in the house. All of a sudden, I hear the refrigerator door open. Everybody knows that sound. I get up and open the door. I look to the left where the kitchen was. The refrigerator door was closed, but the kitchen light was now off. In fact, all the lights on the left side of the house were off. Now I'm low-key starting to panic thinking that there's a burglar or something in the house. So I quietly walk to the living room, keeping my eye on the dark dining room area, and then turn on the TV, turning up the volume as loud as I can. I then turn on the kitchen light, which slightly illuminates the dining room. 
I then quickly turned on the dining room light and jumped into the middle of the room, yelling, hoping that I would frighten any trespassers. However, no one was there. I then run through the entire house as fast as I could, bashing doors and yelling as I do so. No one other than me was inside the house, and all the doors and windows were closed and locked. If someone had opened the fridge, they wouldn't have had enough time to get past the door to go outside without me seeing. I go back into my brother-in-law's room, lock the door, and blast the TV as loud as I could, and played Halo 3 until my mom got home. I know that our landlord's parents had both died inside that house of old age. The kitchen and the dining room were the spots where most of the activity took place. Before this, I didn't really believe in ghosts or demonic entities, but the power of experience is persuading. Who doesn't love a good ghost story? Especially around the holidays. I've reviewed countless accounts of the paranormal and supernatural in online articles and TV shows. I speak from experience when I say, until it happens to you, you will have a hard time believing any of these stories. I openly admit that some are more plausible than others, and most of the ones you hear about nowadays are just made up garbage. With that being said, I will ask the listener to please keep an open mind. My goal in submitting my story is not to convince anyone of the existence of the paranormal, but to simply share my experience with the world. Perhaps someone in the audience has gone through something similar, and can have some type of reassurance that they're not alone, and that there are some things out there that science cannot always explain. But I must warn you, things are going to get pretty deep. Back in law school, my professor would often say, Sometimes it's hard to remain objective in a subjective reality. I couldn't agree more. I come from a very wealthy family. My grandfather was the co-founder of one of the biggest pharmaceutical corporations in Canada. My father followed in his footsteps and eventually became CEO when my grandfather became too old to run the company. I'm not going to get into this too much, but this all played a pretty significant role in me pursuing my law degree. I love my family, but I am not blind to the unfair practices that pharmaceutical corporations get up to, and my family's company is no exception. That's partly why I decided to become a labor attorney. I wanted to protect the little guy from being screwed over by the big corporations. I'd like to think that I make a difference, but I'm not going to lie. The good guys do not always win. This story isn't about that. And I'm sorry if I sound like I'm preaching. I just wanted you guys to know a little bit about me. Now let's turn back the clock to the winter of 1985. It was late December, right around Christmas time. Now I mentioned earlier that my grandfather founded his company in Canada. However, my father was born in New England, and that's where me and my sister grew up. Every year, my father and grandfather would go on these extended hunting trips in upstate New York. My grandparents owned an old manor there, and that's where me and my family would spend most of our Christmases. The manor was enormous. It was three stories tall, had a fountain out front, and of course, was surrounded on all sides by a thick forest. I can't recall all the history of the manor, but I do know that it was originally built as a hospital in colonial times and that many people died there because of the lack of understanding when it came to certain illnesses in those times. As you can imagine, this place had its share of ghost stories. But me and my sister didn't really invest much into such things. We were more interested in playing hide-and-go-seek or tag in the long, endless corridors. The mansion had a very large basement. My grandparents would store a lot of antiques and furniture that they had collected over the years. We were never allowed down there, because my parents were worried that we would hurt ourselves or end up breaking something extremely valuable. So naturally, being the curious troublemakers we were, whenever my sister and I were left alone in the old house, we would always try and see if the door that led down into the basement was left unlocked. Much to our dismay, it never was. But this did not deter us. 
In fact, we sort of turned it into a game and roamed through the old house looking for the magic key that would open the basement door. However, in the winter of 1985, everything would change. My father and grandfather were off on their traditional hunting trip, and my mother and grandmother were doing some Christmas shopping in town. At this time, I was 15, and my sister Natalia was 12. So we were old enough to be on our own for a while. We no longer played our little games around the manor, but we were both still very curious about what was in the basement. So, as soon as we were left alone, we quickly made our way to the basement door. We expected it to be locked, as it had been so many times before. But with a turn of the old metal handle, the door swung open with a creak. I flipped the switch on the wall to my right, and a single light bulb flickered to life above my head, revealing a set of old wooden stairs that led down into the dark basement. I turned back to my sister, and she seemed just as astonished as I was. After so many years, we would finally get to see what was down in the basement. We made our way down the staircase and stumbled around in the darkness. The initial creepiness was replaced by aggravation, as we could not locate another light switch that would illuminate the rest of the basement. Natalia rushed back up the stairs to grab a pair of flashlights from our suitcases. She returned a short time later, and soon our flashlight beams revealed a maze of sheets covering various unknown objects. If I can give you an accurate description of what was in this basement, think of the movie The Others, where Nicole Kidman's character encountered the old blind woman in the junk room. Remember how those white sheets were covering all the furniture? Imagine that on a larger scale. Me and Natalia made our way through the sea of obstacles, occasionally uncovering the ones that looked like they had an interesting shape to them. They were mostly old-fashioned tables, chairs, and shelves, stuff that we were just too young to truly appreciate. When we got to the very back of the basement, there was a corridor that went back for about 30 feet and then suddenly stopped. It was an odd design. It looked like a hallway that was walled off halfway through. There was something mounted to the very end of this corridor that was covered by a white, dirty bedsheet. Curious, we both approached the unknown object. I instantly noticed that there was a light fixture on the ceiling, along with a switch on the wall to my left. I flipped the switch, and the corridor was illuminated. We both turned our attention to the dirty sheet that was ominously covering whatever was on the wall in front of us. There wasn't much discussion between us. It was mutually decided that we were going to find out what was underneath. We both pulled on either side of the sheet to discover an old wall-mounted mirror. Since we were on either side of the mirror when we pulled the sheet off, we didn't see our reflections right away. The mirror had one of those worn down carved frames, and its glass was badly stained and cracked. It wouldn't have looked out of place in a dumpster. But as we would soon find out, this was no ordinary mirror. Natalia bent down to tie her shoe as I stood in front of the mirror. At first, it was difficult to make out my reflection. But I was startled to discover that an old man was staring back at me. I dropped my flashlight out of fear and fell backward. My sister looked up and saw the frightened look on my face and asked me what was wrong. I saw an old man in the mirror. I swear to God. She gave me a confused look before quickly standing up and facing the mirror herself. She instantly went still and then began to visibly tremble. I got to my feet and looked into the mirror. Aside from the horrified look on my sister's face, both of our reflections were normal. However, something was seriously freaking my sister out. I placed my hand on her shoulder and was about to ask her if she was okay. But before I could get a word out, I was cut off by a shriek of terror. <coughs> my sister screamed so loud, I'm surprised she didn't shatter the old mirror. 
she took off back into the basement and up the stairs. I looked one last time at my blurry reflection before turning off the light and following my sister back up the stairs. Natalia was inconsolable after that. She spent the rest of that night crying in bed. From that day forward, Natalia wasn't the same person. She became cold and distant, and this lasted for years. As she got older, she became bitter towards everyone, and had these night terrors where she would wake up screaming, always standing in front of her dresser mirror. I knew that whatever she saw in that old mirror in my grandparents' manor was the root cause of all of this. What I saw in its reflection was certainly frightening, but I eventually put it behind me. Whatever she saw must have been much worse, to the point where it mentally scarred her. I tried talking to her about it several times, but she would always shut me down, even threatening to kill me in my sleep on one occasion. I brought up what happened in the basement to my parents, but all they did was scold me for going down there. Natalia's strange behavior didn't go unnoticed by my parents, and it wasn't long before she was attending therapy, and shortly after, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. The night terrors became worse, and she even started sleepwalking. She would go to the different mirrors in our house and just stare into them for hours before screaming. From a young age, Natalia had a gift for drawing pictures. Before that day at the manor, she would draw typical pictures of our family holding hands, flowers, and birds, etc. But after that day in the basement, she would draw these pictures of a mangled-looking woman who had half of her face missing. Natalia's mental health would continue to deteriorate, and as it did, she was put on a cocktail of different medications. The drugs stopped the screaming, but Natalia became a shell of her former self, reduced to just sitting and staring blankly off into space. This tore my family apart. My parents could never agree on how to go about treating Natalia. My father wanted to commit her to a mental hospital, but my mother was adamantly against that. This caused them to fight a lot, and they would eventually divorce many years later. Shortly after graduating high school, I moved out of my parents' house. My dad rented out an apartment for me while I attended college, and I was grateful for that. As difficult as it is for me to admit, I did not want to be around Natalia anymore, and I no longer wanted to watch my mother try so desperately to get through to her, trying to bring back the sweet girl she once was. Some time passed, and one day I received a phone call from my dad. I could tell by the sound of his voice that he did not have good news. He eventually told me that my sister had wandered away from the house the night before and made her way to a nearby busy highway. This next part is difficult for me to relay, and I will not go into details, but according to the police, several eyewitnesses saw Natalia throw herself in front of a speeding semi-truck. About a week later, as I watched my sister's closed casket being lowered into the ground, I kept thinking about that old mirror in the basement of my grandparents' manor. With my sister's diagnosis and the passing of time, I had forgotten all about that day, and I began to wonder, what did she see in its reflection that day? That question wouldn't be answered until many years later. In 2017, my mother passed away, and me and my wife spent a couple of days gathering all of her belongings from her house before we put it on the market. In my mother's attic, I came across a box marked Natalia. The box contained some of my sister's old clothes and other small things. At the very bottom of the box, I found a large folder. In this folder were some of Natalia's old drawings. I flipped through the pictures. Most of them were drawings of our happy family, holding hands with big smiles on our faces. All except for one. When I got to the very last drawing in the folder, tears began to roll down my face as I held up that last picture. The question that has haunted me for so many years was finally answered. 
The drawing was of a little girl staring into an old mirror, and the mirror's reflection was a mangled woman with half a face. So this happened over the course of a year, in the fall of 2005. I moved into Goldstein Hall for my freshman year of college. Goldstein Hall was your typical three-story dormitory, built in the 60s and had seen better days. My room was your typical cinder block dorm. It wasn't very fancy, but it was home for the year. I quickly threw myself into the college lifestyle. Classes, sports, parties, and living on pizza. Things were normal at first. My roommate Alex was a very shy kid who liked computers and watching football games. But he was homesick and he spent a lot of time at home. So I would get the room to myself. One day while typing up a paper on my computer, I felt a chill go up my back as my TV suddenly turned on. I was creeped out. But I tried telling myself that I must have accidentally hit the remote button even though I knew it was on my bed. There were times I would hear knocks at my window, but nobody would be there. Or I would have my door open and see it slam shut, as though it had been hit with a gust of wind. One day I came home to find my radio was on, even though I knew I had turned it off when I left for classes that day. I would see books being out of place, and there was this one time that my Phillies baseball cap, that I couldn't find for a week, suddenly appeared on top of my computer. Every once in a while, I would smell the strong smell of cologne in my room, despite the fact that I don't wear cologne, and Alex was almost never in the room. Each time something weird happened, I always tried to explain it away to myself, with less and less success. The weirdest incident of that semester happened when Alex and I were sitting in the dorm, watching Thursday Night Football when out of nowhere, our microwave came on for about five seconds and then stopped. Alex and I looked at each other for a moment, not saying a word. Then we went back to just watching the game. He wound up skipping his Friday morning classes and immediately went home the next day. The end of the semester came and Alex decided that he was going to transfer out of the school. I wasn't too surprised because I knew that he wasn't really into going here. After finals, I decided to be nice and help Alex load up his car. My family wasn't going to pick me up for winter break until the next day, so I had no problem with helping the guy move out. We had just finished packing up Alex's car in the parking lot, and we started to say our goodbyes, when Alex suddenly looked at me with a serious expression on his face. He then said, I don't know how you can stand being in that room. You know what I'm talking about. I then let out a deep breath. <sighs> yeah, I know. I'll be fine. We then shook hands, and I watched Alex leave Goldstein Hall for the last time. Luckily, nothing weird happened that night, and over winter break, I managed to convince myself that I was just having an overactive imagination. The new semester started in mid-January of 2006, and I was excited for my new roommate, this time it was a guy named Matthew, who was redshirting for the football team. Matthew was pretty nice, although I didn't have a lot in common with him. Matthew stayed for about the first week of classes, and then immediately switched to another dorm. He didn't even say a word to me about it. I came home from classes one day, and all of his stuff was gone. When Matthew left, all the strange stuff that had been going on in the previous semester started up again. I was willing to deal with the weirdness of the room, because I liked having a double room to myself, for the price of a single room. As a means to cope, I started drinking more. Hey, I was 19 at the time. I learned to ignore it when a weird chill went around the room, or when my favorite sweater would be on my bed instead of in my closet where I had left it, or when I would fall asleep in my bunk bed and hear rustling on the bunk above me, even though it should have been empty. Denial is a beautiful thing. The year eventually started to wind down, and in early April, I wound up getting really drunk at a lacrosse party. And we're talking really drunk. 
like just short of being a hospital drunk. My friends Mason and Ryan walked me home that night, and I remember them helping me get into my bed and placing a trash can right next to it just in case I got sick. I then fell into a deep, drunken sleep. Suddenly I felt water splash across my face. A guy that I didn't recognize stood over me, holding a water bottle. From what I could make out in the dark, he was a short, stocky guy with blonde hair and brown eyes. He yelled at me that there was a fire and that I needed to get out of the building. Confused as to how he got into my room and still being pretty drunk, I somehow managed to grab my phone and stumble out of the building with the fire alarm blaring and the sprinklers going off. The guy was right behind me until I lost him in the crowd of residents and RAs who were standing in the parking lot in front of the building, waiting for the fire trucks to arrive. It turned out that some genius in his drunken state tried to set off firecrackers in the common area on the second floor, which started the fire. We were allowed to move back in two weeks later, after all the water damage was repaired. When I got back, nothing happened in that dorm for the last two weeks. I tried looking for the guy that had woken me up in the dorm, but I couldn't find him anywhere. And eventually the year was over, and I left that dorm for good. Fast forward to about Halloween weekend, 2006. I moved back home and switched to commuting to school because frankly, I had had enough of the dorm life experience. I made friends with a kid in my drama class named John. John was your typical theater nerd and we got along pretty well. That Saturday afternoon, we were working together in the library for a test. Given that it was Halloween weekend, John and I started talking about our weird experiences. That's when I mentioned that I had been subjected to weird occurrences at Goldstein Hall. John looked at me dead in the eye and said, You know that's where a kid died back in the 80s, right? My uncle who went here at the time told me about it. John went on to tell me that in April of 1986, a group of guys who were in a frat decided to set off a smoke bomb inside the common area on the second floor of Goldstein Hall. It started a fire that quickly got out of control, and a student died. He was found in his dorm on the first floor, apparently dying of smoke inhalation while trying to escape. Naturally, the story spooked me, and feeling immensely curious, I asked John if he wanted to look up the yearbook archives that were in the library. He agreed, and we were able to find the 1986 yearbook. I thumbed through the yearbook, and then froze when I found what I knew I was going to find. There was a memorial page to the fire victim, Kevin W. Anderson, born August 15th, 1967, and died April 6th, 1986. The smiling photo of Kevin looked exactly like the guy who had woken me up in my dorm the night of the fire. It's been 10 years since I first set foot in that house. This is the most terrifying experience of my life. And as someone who experiences the strange, unexplained, and the frightening more than the average person, I don't say that lightly. To better explain things, I'll put it this way. I've had quite a few experiences with spirits. I can feel them strongly, and I've always been able to. I can usually tell if they're male or female as well. So when it comes to the supernatural, I am almost completely unfazed. Even so, the trip I took with my closest friends would change everything. It was 2010, and I was visiting what is basically the mecca for fans of my favorite TV show. You see, even though it was filmed in a studio, exterior shots of this house were used in the series as the residence of the main characters. Still, it's private property. You can't just knock on the door and look around. You have to reserve a room there. That's what made my chance to be there so special. I received an invitation through a dear friend of mine, who happens to be a friend of the owners. There was a big fundraiser there in the form of a Halloween party. A select few people received an invitation and paid the amount of money to stay there for several days. All of the money raised went to help restore the house, 
so it was for a good cause. The house itself was very old and had an interesting history. It had three floors, plus a basement and an attic. Almost every part of the mansion has a story behind it. It was exactly the kind of place I've always dreamed of staying in. Yeah, Halloween in a big old spooky house. Fun, right? Well, it was, for the most part anyway. At this time, I had known my friends for about seven or eight years, including my best friend. She's very much one of those stereotypical New Yorkers you see on TV. Sarcasm is her native tongue, and she won't hesitate to call anyone out on their bullshit. She's also a big sci-fi nerd, and one of the smartest people that I know. She's basically the sister I never had. She's also my frequent traveling companion and roommate when we attended conventions. So it was a no-brainer that we'd room together for that week. Nothing could be more natural. What wasn't natural was the very high paranormal activity taking place in the house. These old mansions always seemed to have a ghost or two. Well, at least one on every floor. Most of them didn't bother me. I would even say that I felt comforted by their presence at times. There was a little girl in the attic that tugged on the back of my shirt and spoke to me. There was a man who walked the corridors near the grand staircase who said hello to me and even saved me from falling down the marble staircase. There were spirits that I saw in the basement and near the ballroom who I believed to be the original owner and his wife. They were all harmless. However, in the wing that contained the old servant's quarters, there was a different fill. There was definitely something there. Something dark. The large house seemed full of life, with so many people staying in every room, with the exception being the basement. The larger room has held three to five people. For my friend and I, this meant that we would be rooming together in one of the smaller rooms of the house, located in the wing that once held the help. I didn't mind at all. I was just happy and grateful to even be there. But from the moment I set foot in that room, it felt wrong. It was unnerving. It was like something was staring at me in a predatory manner. My eyes immediately darted towards an empty corner of the room, and I could see a spirit there. It was a male. And though I was staring right back at him, he had the nerve to continue to stare back at me his eyes scanning my body, looking at me like he was a starving animal. I turned to my friend and muttered, There's a man staring at me in the corner. She immediately brushed it off. It's an old house. You're just imagining it. I could almost feel the spirit smirking at me as I put my suitcase in the room and quickly left to go find my other friends and explore the rest of the house. As much as I love my best friend, she wasn't like me. She couldn't see spirits, and she certainly didn't believe in them. I spent the rest of the day with my friends, away from that room. So by the time I came back into the room at night, I had almost forgotten about what happened earlier. At that moment, it was just a small room in an old house, and I was very tired. Even though I usually have trouble sleeping in new places, I fell asleep pretty easily. The next day was spent with more exploration of the house, as well as excursions into the lovely town that had once been a playground for the rich. I was having a lot of fun. The days flew by. And yet here and there, while I was in that room, I often felt that predatory spirit staring me down. I tried to avoid that room as much as possible, which was pretty easy to do as there was a lot to see and experience. This trip was a dream come true, and before I knew it, the big Halloween party was upon us. That year, the party was held on the night of October 30th, two days before I had to return home. Everyone had been eagerly anticipating the party. We couldn't wait to show off our costumes. There would be music and dancing in the ballroom that night, and the majority of us were dressed up as characters from the show, I was wearing this gorgeous historical style red and cream dress, but the heaviness of the fabric and the layers left me sweating in an unladylike fashion. 
By the early morning hours of October 31st, with the party dying down, I couldn't wait to get out of my dress and go to bed. I walked down the empty corridor. It was completely silent. I entered our room to see that my friend was totally passed out. She can literally sleep through a hurricane. In fact, I even watched her sleep through Hurricane Sandy a few years after this. I locked the door behind me, simply for the reason that I would be sleeping in the corner closest to the door, and I didn't want to get smacked in the head. My bed consisted of a sleeping bag on an air mattress, while my friend was on a twin-sized bed almost diagonal from me. I was hot and sweaty after climbing the stairs and going down that long, dark hallway. My dress was so heavy, all I wanted to do was take it off and put on my nightgown. As I pulled the dress over my head, I got this strange feeling that my friend refers to as my spidey sense. It's a tingling sensation that I get on top of my head when I sense spirits nearby. It was that man in the corner again, staring at me. Of course, he would show up when I was naked and vulnerable. I could feel his eyes on my body, and there was nothing I could do but to cover myself up with my nightgown as quickly as possible. By the time I was done, the spirit was gone. I decided to brush it off and go to bed. I was tired, and we had big plans for today. I turned off the lights, got into my sleeping bag, and turned over to face the wall and tried to get some sleep. When suddenly, I thought I heard my name being called. Catherine. Whoever was in the hallway calling my name could wait till morning, but I heard it again, clearer this time. Catherine. But I could not place the voice. Again, I tried to ignore it. Then it came a third time. Catherine. There was no knock at the door, and my friend was still sleeping. Just ignore it. They'll go away in a minute when they find the door locked, I'm sure of it. They can probably hear my friend snoring, I thought to myself. The room suddenly became freezing cold. It was my first October on the East Coast. I vaguely recalled someone mentioning that there could be snow that night, so I shrugged it off and burrowed deeper into my sleeping bag. The air in the room almost felt electrified. It was getting harder for me to fall asleep. I then heard from the corner of the room the sound of footsteps. He was there. As I said before, I've had a lot of experience with the supernatural, but I have never felt so terrified. This was unlike anything I had ever experienced. The presence felt so predatory, but even worse, he radiated an aura of pure evil. From my position on the floor, I not only heard his slow, deliberate footsteps coming towards me, but I could feel him as well. He emerged from his empty corner came around to the side of my air mattress, where he crouched down. I was frozen in fear. A very large male hand covered my mouth, stifling my sobs as he violated me. In my head, I frantically began reciting half-forgotten prayers, chants, and mantras, anything I could think of to get him off of me. I've never been a very religious person, but I was so scared in that moment I could think of nothing else I could do. I prayed to every god I could think of. Something must have connected, because my attacker suddenly froze, and then disappeared. I flung the sleeping bag off of me, jumped up, and turned on the light. No one was there. My friend was still snoring, and the door was locked. I was shaking badly. I ran a hand over my face, and discovered that I had been crying from fear. I had to get out of there. I frantically unlocked the door, threw it open, and ran blindly down the dark hallway towards the stairs. I couldn't think beyond getting down to the solarium, where surely someone would still be awake. I came upon two of my friends heading up to bed, and began to babble incoherently. I must have looked like a mad person, running down the hallway in my long white nightgown, 
babbling about a man that wasn't there. They had never seen me so hysterical before, but since they had known me for about seven years by then, they immediately believed me. They told me I couldn't go back in that room and to come with them. That's when I suddenly realized I was cold running around in my nightgown. Okay, just let me go get my robe. I slowly walked back down the hallway towards the bedroom, realizing as I approached that the door was now closed. With trepidation, my shaking hand took hold of the doorknob. But it would not turn. It was locked. I knocked on the door and tried to loudly whisper to my friend, but she couldn't hear me over her snoring. I could sense that evil spirit still in the room. Don't ask me how, but somehow I knew. He wanted me to beg him to open the door. There was no way I was going to do that. I turned away to go back with my friends, but they were no longer in that wing of the house, and I had no idea what room they were staying in. They basically ditched me. Not knowing what else to do, I went downstairs to find the lights off in the solarium and a lit fireplace. I knew that they wouldn't leave this fire unattended for long. So I curled up in a ball and waited for them to return. I could see through the windows that it was getting lighter. The sun would be coming up over the ocean soon. I saw movement on the terrace and a group of guys came stumbling in drunk. After the party, they went walking down by the ocean. There was one that I didn't recognize, and he asked me if I was okay, and the story of what I had just experienced came pouring out. Me and him sat there and talked until the sun came up. I thought he kind of looked like the movie star John Gilbert, and was instantly attracted to him. We even began dating soon after this. But anyways, the sounds of life began to fill the old house again as the people got out of their beds. Later that morning, I relayed this experience to one of my friends, who said that there was somebody a part of the group who was even more sensitive to the paranormal than myself. I talked to this person and asked him if he could come up to my room for a minute. I gave him no details about what happened that morning. We walked to the door of the room and upon entering, he stared right into the corner with a serious expression on his face. Catherine, you can't stay here tonight. Get all your stuff and get out. Don't leave anything in here and never come back to this room. He'll be back for you tonight and he will attack you. I stood there, mouth agape, completely astonished and horrified. Every hair on my body stood straight up did you not understand what I just told you? Hurry up, get your stuff, and let's go. I glanced over at my best friend's bed. What about my friend? He's not after her. He wants you. My blood ran cold. I quickly grabbed all of my things and moved into an empty room across the hall. The last night of my trip, nothing happened, and I flew home the next day. I thought it was over, but the following year I ended up returning to that mansion for the next Halloween party. My boyfriend, the John Gilbert lookalike, had proposed that year, but about a week before the Halloween trip, things fell apart and we broke up. I ended up going with my best friend as I had the year before. All the guests were supposed to stay in the gatehouse that year, but the boiler had gone out, so everyone was moved into the main house. I found out that we had been assigned to the room that I stayed in on my final night last year. I felt safe in that room, even though I knew it was right across the hall from his room. I thought it would be okay, but I was wrong. That night my friend was on the single bed, and I was on the floor again in my sleeping bag on the air mattress. The door was locked and the room wasn't dark this time. It was lit by a small lamp on the bedside table. Because of what happened the year before, I developed horrible insomnia, and sometimes didn't sleep for days in a row. But I managed to doze off for a while. But something woke me up. 
all was quiet. Then I felt that familiar tingling. I'm safe in this room. The door's locked. I repeated to myself like a mantra. And then heard movement from across the hall. From where I was on the floor, I could see under the door quite clearly. I couldn't see anyone or anything. Then I heard the footsteps. He knew I was there. He was coming for me. The footsteps came from that corner of the room across the hall, then stopped right in front of my door. There was no one there. I could clearly see an empty space beneath the crack under the door, where a pair of feet should have been. And yet, the doorknob began to rattle. I was barely breathing as I watched the doorknob move faster and faster. And then, it stopped. Then the entire door itself began to rattle and shake. I began to cry and curled into the fetal position, my eyes never leaving the door. I have never felt so helpless. Then, it finally just stopped. There wasn't a sound from the hallway. He was gone. But there was no way in hell I was leaving that room until the sun was up. In the morning I told my friend that I couldn't stay in that room. Hell, I could no longer stay in that wing of the house. I would sleep anywhere, on the couch in front of the fireplace, in the tower room, the attic, the basement, anywhere but in that wing of the house. I ended up sleeping on the couch the following night, but left my suitcase in the room with my friend. In the morning, in the cheery light of day, I ventured to the room to get clean clothes so I could shower. As I approached the door, I saw a strange sight. There was a single red apple on the floor in front of the door to the room. I knew that it was for me. It was a message of some sort. The door to the room was locked, so I knocked, calling my friend's name. She poked her head out from a door down the hallway. Hey, I thought you were in there. No, I slept downstairs last night. Then who locked the door? And is that your apple? It's not mine. She then made a joke about someone leaving me a midnight snack. I laughed, but still made no move to touch the apple. I got the spare key from the owner and opened the door to see all of my clothes and things thrown around the room. I had reached my breaking point and I couldn't take any more of this. I packed up all of my things and spent the remainder of the trip in the tower room with my friends. It's taken me a long time to be able to even talk about this. I've been back to that house many times, but I've never stayed in that wing again. And even then, I can still feel him there, in the corner of that room, waiting for me in the dark. I want to share a story from my childhood. I've never been sensitive to the paranormal, but there was one encounter I've had in my life that has made quite an impact on me. I'm originally from a small town in northern New Hampshire, a stone's throw away from the Canadian border. After my grandmother passed away in 1996, we moved into her house across town. I've never met my grandmother because of the complicated relationship between her and my father. I'll get more into that later. The house was an old two-story that resembled a Victorian home. However, it had this strange appearance. It was like two houses were built very close to each other and it was decided at some point that they should just become one unit. Many of the bedrooms on the second level had a severely slanted ceiling from the awkward architecture. I remembered calling them pizza slices. The master bedroom was located downstairs. That's where my parents stayed. I was told that I had to choose one of the upstairs bedrooms, and as I mentioned before, most of them looked like pizza slices. But there was one on the opposite side of the hallway that was normal looking so I decided to move into that one. 
Things were uneventful for the first two months, but all that would change one night. I remembered that it was storming outside, and I was having trouble falling asleep. I kept feeling this itchy sensation on the back of my head, and my throat felt like it was on fire. At first, I thought it was coming down with an infection. I was about to get up and grab a drink of water when I saw someone standing in the doorway. It was a middle-aged man staring daggers at me. I had no idea who he was. I thought someone had broken into the house. I tried to scream, but the feeling in my throat made it impossible. The stranger glared at me before he turned around. The lightning outside my window then lit up the bedroom. What I saw in the flash absolutely terrified me. The back of the man's head was missing. All that was there was a massive hole in his brain with bits of flesh hanging from it. I was maybe seven years old at the time. I had never been exposed to what the inside of a man's skull looked like. The man disappeared and I got up and ran out of the bedroom, rushing into my parents' room and waking them up. After my mom calmed me down, I told her what I saw, standing in my doorway. I remembered my mother and father exchanging worried looks, but not saying anything about it. They didn't even try to convince me that I was just having a nightmare. They told me that I could sleep in their room for the rest of the night. The next day, my dad moved all of my stuff into one of the other bedrooms. I remember standing in the hallway, watching him hammering boards over my old bedroom door. When I asked him why, this is what he said. Son, I'm going to tell you the truth, and you're going to have to be a man and deal with it. Your grandfather was an evil, cruel bastard who hated life so much that he ended it. That's who you saw last night, and I think he chose this room to do it in. So it's not a good idea for you or anyone else to go in here anymore. And that was that. I stayed in one of the pizza slice rooms until I left for college in 2009. Years later, I discovered that my grandfather was an abusive alcoholic who eventually cleaned his mouth out with a double barrel shotgun. My father explained to me that when he was growing up, my grandmother refused to do anything about my grandfather's abusive behavior. And when I say abusive, I'm suggesting that there was more than just physical assaults happening. My grandmother even blamed my father for his suicide, which explains why the relationship between my grandmother and my father was so estranged. It was a really fucked up situation. My father was no longer living there when it happened, so he wasn't sure which room he chose to do it in. After what I saw that night, that was all the confirmation he needed. I was wondering why he would ever move back there. Apparently there were some financial hardships going on in our family that basically forced us to move into that house after my grandmother passed away. Otherwise, my dad would have never even thought about it. My parents eventually moved out of that place shortly after I left for college. My dad sold off that property to a developer under the condition that they would demolish that house. I believe that they have built a hotel in its place. Looking back, I do appreciate my dad telling me the truth from the very beginning. Knowing who it was I saw that night was somehow able to help me deal with it better. I guess it just made sense to a seven-year-old me. After that room was boarded up, I never saw the ghost of my grandfather ever again. And with that house now completely destroyed, I hope he's in hell, where he belongs. Thank you for watching. If you have a story that you would like to share on this channel, please send it to my email, unit522stories at outlook.com. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button when notifications turned on. You can further support my channel by visiting the merch store. A link for that is in the description. You'll be hearing from me soon. Until next time, I'm your Uncle Unit. And as always, never forget. So